were opened, the fault took 14 minutes to sink to an upright position in 36 feet of water. The fourth fault, HM Fort Knock John, was towed down river on August the 1st, 1942, leaving Tilbury at 5.40 in the early morning. It on was towed down river on August the 1st, 1942, leaving Tilbury at 5.40 in the early morning. It arrived at the grounding site at 1 p.m., but had to await the arrival of the naval ship HMS Campbell, which had on board the first sea lord, Admiral Fraser, Lord Louis Mountbatten and General Pyle, who were to act as observers. With the arrival of the ship at 3 p.m., the order was relayed for the pontoon flood valves to be opened, and this action was taken at 3.32 p.m. It took 14 minutes for the fort to be grounded in 40 feet of water. Again, by good fortune, a cinefilm taken of the Knock John sinking at the time has survived, and this illustrates how a correct sinking should take place. in Egypt. There he gave inspiration and confidence to the Allied plan to use a reinforced concrete artificial harbour for the invasion of Europe. Ultimately known as the Mulberry Harbour used in Normandy, this invention certainly gave the Allies the edge which the Germans had not been expecting. With his naval sea fort design, Maunsell had proved that it was possible to sink a large reinforced concrete structure onto an unprepared seabed. The four naval sea forts were positioned in the Thames estuary as shown. The two northerly forts were resupplied from Harwich and their crews were shore based at HMS Badger at Parkston Quay when not on the forts. The two southerly forts were resupplied from Sheerness and were shore based at HMS Wildfire. Shortly after completing the second naval fort, Maunsell submitted to the Admiralty a new fort design which he had prepared to accommodate a heavy anti-aircraft gun battery. This design was to be used for deployment in the Liverpool Bay area where it was proposed to site 38 such towers. A decision was also made to place 49 of these towers in the Thames estuary and 13 in the Humber estuary. Work on the Liverpool Bay Towers started in March 1942 and was curtailed at 21 towers built due to a cutback in requirements notified to the contractor, the Cleveland Bridge and Engineering Company Limited, in January 1943. Similar reductions were made affecting the Thames Estuary requirement, which was reduced to 21 towers, and also the Humber Estuary, which was cancelled altogether built two at a time in the cofferdam. They measured 85 feet across and were approximately 6 foot by 5 feet in section. On completion they were floated out at high tide to prepared pedestal berths situated on the foreshore. Here the reinforced concrete leg sections which had been precast in advance were added to the base in increments until the required height of 70 feet was reached. At this stage, a concrete cap was added, on top of which a steel superstructure was built. This consisted of a steel house 36 feet square and approximately 20 feet deep. In this structure, divided into two floors, were housed the equipment and crew accommodation. Depending on its function, the top floor or roof had either a 3.7 inch anti-aircraft gun mounted, or a pair of 40 millimeter Bofors guns, radar or a searchlight. There were seven towers to a complete fort comprising four with 3.7 inch guns, one with two Bofors guns, one with radar and one with a searchlight. Once positioned each tower was interconnected by a steel catwalk with wooden flooring. For towing down river to their grounding sites, it was necessary to position each tower to the underside of two barges, which were known as camels. In the case of the Thames forts, two local barges, named Gold and Silver, were modified by inserting an extra 20-foot section. 
Once in position, the two barges were slowly towed by three or four tugs to their sites. On reaching the site, previously surveyed by the Admiralty Hydrographer, the tower was winched down by hand onto the seabed. This procedure taking quite some time, as accuracy was essential. The Bofors Tower was always the first tower to be positioned in any group, as it offered immediate defence against any attacking enemy aircraft. The set of seven towers were placed in a particular pattern as shown in the drawing, and the three sets of towers placed in the Thames estuary were situated at the Nor, Red Sands and Shivering Sands as depicted on the map. The Nor towers were positioned over the period May the 20th to July the 4th, 1943. The Red Sands over the period July the 23rd to September the 3rd, 1943, and Shivering Sands over the period September the 18th to December the 13th, 1943. During their wartime service, all of the towers combined were responsible for destroying 22 aircraft and 30 V-1 flying bombs or doodlebugs. With the war ending in 1945, both the naval and army forts were put on care and maintenance and they remained in this state until abandoned by the government in 1956. There was a disaster on March the 1st, 1953, when a Swedish ship, the Baalbek, crashed into the Nor Towers, knocking over a gun tower and the Bofors Tower, killing four civilian caretakers. The Admiralty subsequently ordered the removal of this wreckage and the remaining towers in 1959-60 and they were dismantled and sold for scrap. The concrete leg sections were blown off just above the base and the bases were uplifted and towed to Alpha Wharf Cliff where they remain and can be seen to this day. This operation, carried out by the Port of London Authority, cost the enormous sum of £8 million at 1995 prices. On June the 7th, 1963, a ship named the Rybersborg ran into the Shivering Sands and knocked over a gun tower. No one was hurt, but the fort was left in a dilapidated state. During the period from 1964 to 1967, all of the forts were occupied by various radio pirate stations until the action by the government of introducing new legislation made the situation untenable and they were evacuated. With the exception of the Sunk Head Naval Fort, which was blown up by the Royal Engineers in August 1967, and the Nor Forts removed in 1959-60, all of the other Mortsall Sea Forts built in the war still exist. Ruff's Towers was occupied in 1967 by Roy Bates, who claimed the fort as the independent state of Sealand. Despite the difficulties and cost of resupply from Holland, there is a question of the legality of supplying the fort from the UK. Roy Bates has retained ownership to this day, selling Sealand postage stamps and Sealand currency to collectors. Today, the forts remain defiant in the estuary. All of the interconnecting catwalks were destroyed by the Admiralty in the early 1970s and all of the armament removed between 1956 and June 1992 when the Tung Sands and Knock John forts finally gave up their 3.7 inch guns to land-based museums. The final few minutes of this video show the forts as they were in August 1995. They appear in this order. Red Sands, Shivering Sands, Knock John and Tung Sands. The total cost of the Mortsall Seafort programme, including the 21 towers in Liverpool Bay, amounted to the staggering sum of £44,385,280 at 1995 prices. Add to this the cost of removing the Nor Towers in 1959-60 and the Mersey Towers removed in 1948, and the resultant figure is nearer £60 million. My name is Frank Turner, and I am the producer of this video, which I hope you have enjoyed. 
I have over the past two years carefully researched the history of the Maunsell Sea Forts, which has culminated in my writing of two full-length books, The Maunsell Sea Forts Part 1, The World War II Naval Sea Forts of the Thames Estuary, and The Maunsell Sea Forts Part 2, The World War II Army Sea Forts of the Thames and Mersey Estuaries. In addition, there are a number of small A5 booklets describing previously classified secret projects that Guy Maunsell submitted to the government during the war. If you would like further particulars of any of these publications, why not contact me?